Welcome back to the second of the series of discussion on politics and social movement. Uh, here, uh, again, we got uh, our eminent resource person, uh, Mr. Susil Sirivadana. Uh, in this uh, discussion, uh, his experience is really important because he was the commissioner of Janasavya program, one of the best poverty alleviation program uh, sometime back uh, during uh, President Premadasa's period. So most of the uh, post Premadasa period, uh, you know, state uh, government took that as a, as, an, as a model for the development or poverty alleviation. Here, our main focus is to see the connection uh, between politics and social movement. Uh, so how politics and social movement can be linked. Here we have resource person, uh, uh, Susil. He uh, has a lot of experience in uh, working uh, with uh, poverty related issues and also youth uh, issues. Uh, Susil, uh, how do you explain uh, the, do you see connection between politics and social movement? Yes, there is an intimate connection between politics and social movement. Uh, one very dramatic way of uh, seeing this in action is in the various freedom struggles under colonialism. Mm. Of course, freedom struggles uh, involve politics and society. Mm. But, uh, and you know, it's a very integrated struggle which uh, knits together all the different forms of organization, but uh, it's a very clear expression of that struggle. Another example, a very good example and familiar to us, would be the People's Movement, which uh, overthrew the uh, hated uh, previous regime and political order on January 8th. That was a very dramatic movement because it was all compressed into a very short time and uh, it happened in front of our, our very eyes. And uh, then it has been sustained after January 8th. And the voice of civil society never uh, went down, was never reduced after January 8th. On the other hand, it has been sustained and it has been continuing. If you change the, the scenario and go for another example, there has been, for example, people will realize the protests against Wall Street. Mm. Uh, that is, of course, in a developed industrial society of uh, America and uh, Europe, where, uh, again, a group of deprived uh, people and masses have, are stand, uh, rising up in protest against their uh, capitalist rulers. Uh, and uh, the business sector, the multinational corporations, etc., because they find it dif difficult to live. Mm. Uh, though they are developed countries and though the outer form of development is there, uh, from when we look at them or see them on TV, still they have experienced a lot of deprivations which have compelled them yeah. to uh, get onto the streets and even indulge in violence you know, against uh, the uh, police and the state. Mm. So those would be, I would say. So from all those examples, we can uh, draw the uh, inference that uh, social movements are oppositional. Okay. And uh, oppositional in a very definite sense, uh, in a sense that they arise when negotiation is no longer possible. Okay. So it's at an advanced state of uh, sort of uh, uh, exploding, you know, that the social movement really comes out onto the street. So uh, that would be, I would say, the, uh, the, f the fundamental relationship between yeah. social movements and politics. Yeah. In everyday life, we have seen, you know, people fight for various causes, let's say, uh, you know, small example from building a road to uh, developing uh, education, let's say 6% for education uh, movement, right? So people voluntarily develop, uh, develop a kind of, you know, theme, they put forward a theme. But I feel personally, politicians come there and they grab the theme. And from there, they take the baton and uh, take it forward. Uh, how do you s explain this? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good uh, question. A real civil society 
doesn't let politicians or any outsiders uh, grab their platform. Mm. A real so civil society has got to that point of getting onto the street or of uh, you know mobilizing uh, in that sense because they have failed to communicate or negotiate with uh, the po powers that be, mm. you see. And certainly, as you say, I mean, the powers that be, when they realize that the people cannot be contained and that the people are very, very angry and aggressive, mm. they will try to dilute it and co-opt it and so on and so forth. But that is where the unity mm. Mm. and the quality of leadership of a civil society is very important. Not to surrender midway, you know, to various uh, tactics and attempts on the part of uh, political groups to subvert it. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Why, uh, in that sense, uh, as according to my experience, Sri Lankan uh, social movements have failed. In our everyday basis, movements have failed because politicians have grabbed the, uh, grabbed the baton. Uh, why it happens? Why our people are not that politically conscious? Or why, why it is happening? No, no, definitely. I mean, you know, though we have a high late rate of literacy, and uh, though we have uh, a high percentage of people who have uh, passed out at O levels and even uh, A levels, still the uh, those people are not educated or literate in a civil society and in a political sense. Yeah. I mean, in other words, they haven't developed the criticality, the ability to ask questions against the uh, governing forces. Mm. Um, or to put it another way, that is what is called co-optation. I mean, they've been co-opted you know, always uh, the, the elite elite forces and their instruments like the media have been both co-opting them and distracting them, mm -hmm. diverting them. Mm -hmm. Look at the Sunday papers uh, that are put out in Singhala, mm -hmm. in the Singhala language Sunday papers. They all consist of horror stories, ghost stories about karma, this, that. <laughs> Nothing to do with, That's you know, right. the day-to-day -day experience of the people. Yeah, yeah. You know, when there are major issues confronting the society, yeah. the bulk of the media do not uh, concentrate and analyze those issues. That's right. In order to raise the consciousness of the people, they're trying to divert them and distract them, mm. you know, their attention mm. uh, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So that is why, uh, you know, such uh, forces, uh, I mean, uh, die down and don't develop a, an intensity mm. that they should develop. Mm -hmm. In a, every day, in our everyday <clears throat> social life, we have seen people uh, people create politicians, right? People think this is how the politician should behave. You know, this is how sh should be his attire. This is this. You know, he should be having this number of bodyguards. He should be having this number of vehicles. That is how uh, you know politicians are constructed. If uh, if a particular politician doesn't have such power. Such uh, you know material, uh, I don't know material uh, facilities or uh, bodyguards and all. People do not accept. How do you see this? This, uh, in other words, that happens because the political process in our society is always creating myths mm. and always you know cultivating illusions to divert the attention of the people and divert criticism away from the attention of the people. Now that is where community education, citizen yeah. education, adult education is fundamental for the sustenance of a civil society movement. Yeah. And their civil society itself has a lot of lessons to learn because for example, as you know better than me, we have never had an adult education movement in our country. That's right. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, if you look at the rest of the world, I mean, even very developed industrial countries have adult education, particularly in a context of globalization and technology development and such rapid change 
you know, it is very important that the adults can go through a continuous process of what is called lifelong education. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is only then they can appreciate the value mm. of institutions when institutions are going down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I would argue that we need uh, a movement and a process yeah. for community education as a matter of uh, priority. Yes, I, I accept your point. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you know people don't have proper proper understanding about uh, what is conceptual understanding, what is state, what is the role of reg uh, you know what is regime, what is government, what is parliament, what is the role of uh, polit you know parliamentarians and all. Uh, and other, another aspect what we uh, see in every everyday uh, life is that people expect politicians to give uh, them electric electricity supply, water supply, provide them a house. You know, the the state welfare has, you know, the politicians have become agents of state welfare. Welfare, and people to accept it. How do you explain this? Because uh, I mean, our politics has been sustained on the basis of creating dependency. Mm. Mm. Dependency. So, you know, uh, it's a kind of very sort of MP-centric, politician-centric uh, kind, kind of political situation. Mm. And there has been a long period of conditioning where uh, members of the public have been conditioned to go behind politicians to solve their problems. Yeah, that's right. That's a, so that's a yeah. very shrewd yeah. anti-democratic tactic to prevent people from organizing, to weaken civil society, and to uh, cultivate a sense of dependence on individuals yeah. and MPs. Okay. You see, and uh, people don't realize that uh, uh, that is counterproductive. Yeah. And uh, more than that, this is public life. When it comes to private affairs, private life of the people, they invite politicians for weddings, they invite politicians for funerals, and various events of you know individual private life. They change even the auspicious times of the various uh, occasions uh, in order to suit the timetable of the politicians. So, uh, yeah, you have any experience to share? With yes, yes. I mean, you know, that shows the excessive. Uh, dependency and fixation on the part of uh, society on politicians. I mean, uh, we have taken it to extreme uh, levels. And as you say, you know, uh, and that is also a part of uh, the sort of social underdevelopment that, you know, people uh, are very interested in uh, status, show, mm. um, Appearances. Appearances yeah. I mean, that's why you get politicians uh, to come and sign at weddings, <laughs> to come and you know give prizes and so on. I mean, in other words, the point that we are trying to make is that the politician's role is exceeded, you know, in Sri Lankan society. I mean, they have a they have a certain role. I mean, but in Sri Lankan society, that role is uh, practiced beyond mm. all reasonable proportions mm. and exceeded. Yeah. Uh, partly, I think, uh, because of our underdevelopment, and when I say underdevelopment, uh, still, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, hangover of feudalism. Yeah. You see, though we think we are modern and we are no longer feudal, I think there are a lot of uh, feudal uh, hangovers still uh, existent and functional in our mindsets. Yeah. So, yeah, that is really an uh, interesting uh, point to uh, conclude the discussion. Uh, during this session, we were discussing about politics and social movements, and also uh, some extent how, uh, uh, how politicization is happening in the public sphere of the people and also the private sphere. Uh, this is really never-ending debate, and uh, we have taken an initiative, uh, perhaps uh, uh, st as students of politics, of politi politics and social movements, uh, you all can, uh, we all can continue this discussion. Thank you very much.